Hey everybody, welcome back to this series where I go through various RPG products that I have and give them a quick flip through and review. In this video, I'm going to be doing something kind of like, I guess a retrospective sort of. I'm going to be going through the Wormskin scenes, which is where the Dolmenwood setting first was sort of found. It was where it was first presented. Um, now the Dolmenwood setting was kickstarted this past year. There's a physical copy coming, a physical edition of a bunch of new books with great art and all this stuff coming next year, I think in 2024. Um, the PDFs are kind of being released right now to Kickstarter backers. They're not complete yet. I, I kickstarted it at the full tier, and so I'm going to be getting all of it as it comes out. And um, and so I have some of those PDFs already. Not all of them. Um, there's one that they're not finished. The, the art isn't all there. There's a lot of stuff that's still missing from some of the documents. I'm going to do a review of it at some point uh, before the physical books come out, but I'll wait until the PDFs are complete. But in the meantime, I thought this would be kind of a fun way to kind of preview those because obviously a lot of this information is going to be reused in them. But then also to kind of look back on just this as it was. This came out in 2015, the first one did. And just to give a sense of, you know, maybe how things will have changed before the last one. But also just to give you guys this, you know, really, uh, I don't know, two or three of these really beautiful books if you don't have them yourselves. I don't know if you can get them. Um, I think Noble Knight has them in print for like $40 a piece, which is pretty expensive, and I don't think they're all in stock. Um, and I don't think you can get them on DriveThruRPG anymore, so if, if you don't have them, I'm not exactly sure where you're going to be able to get them from. But um, I, if you can get them, I heartily recommend them. Um, and of course, you can always wait for the new books to come out. Uh, you can pre-order them right now. Late Pledge is done, but you can pre-order them. Uh, in physical form at least, the Dolmenwood books. Um, so let's just go through these. There are eight different zines um, of varying lengths. I'm not going to go through them all in, in you know, great detail, but I'll just give you, know, give you guys a flip through and a sense of what's in each of them. The art is beautiful. It's mostly all repurposed art from elsewhere. There's some original pieces here and there, but there's a lot of repurposed art, and uh, it works really well. Now, the new books have all original art, as far as I can tell. Um, so... Uh, there isn't anything that's been reappropriated from, you know, public domain sources or anything like that. So here is the premiere issue. Welcome to Dolmenwood with a shortcut to mushrooms, moss, dwarves, and grimalkin, which are two races, as they're called here in the new book. They're called kindreds. And then root things, which is a new monster type. It's a pretty short book. This one only has 43 pages. And really a lot of that is, you know, just introduction and end cover stuff. There's a lot of attention to detail in these books with beautiful... Um, design patterns and things like that throughout, and it carries over from what I've seen into the new Dolmenwood books too. Gorgeous, absolutely gorgeous. Every detail, uh, every bit has been paid attention to, so it's really, really great. Um, as I said, this is back from uh, 2015. I think Gavin Norman has taken over entirely um, from the, the pair uh, that used to work on it, Gavin Norman and Greg Gorgomilk. Now it's just pretty much uh, Gavin Norman, and I think you know, I've gone through a lot of these books now, and I tend to prefer, I think, Gavin's aesthetic style and, and his uh, design. Certainly his OSE adventures and all of that I really, really like, so I'm glad that he's kind of in charge of the new, uh, the new set. One of the influences, of course, for Dolman Wood is Jonathan Strange and Mr. Norrell, which if you guys haven't read, you should. There's also a great miniseries of it. I think you guys should watch that, too. It's a great... That's actually how I was introduced to it, was through the miniseries. Um... Really, really good. It gets you into this vibe of the kinds of fairies we're talking about here. Fairies which are not cutesy little, you know, tinkerbells. Uh, these are dangerous creatures um, that are in, you know, they're completely other. Totally other. And I like that feeling from the old fairy tales, you know, George MacDonald and um, Arthur Rackham and that sort of thing. Um, and of course, even before that. Here's a map of Western Dolmenwood and then Eastern Dolmenwood. Now, the new maps that have come out are very similar to these in terms of their um, the shapes and where things are, but uh, a lot of the details are different, and certainly the aesthetic style is different. I like these, I think, a little bit more than the new ones, just simply because I think this gives me an old-school nostalgic vibe, which I'm always a sucker for. Uh, here's the Moss Dwarf, which is a race class. This is for, I think, um, Labyrinth Lord. Is that what this originally was written for? Yeah, I think it's Labyrinth Lord uh, BX D&D. Um, OSE is sort of a version of OSE is what the new books are coming out for, but this all works for any old school game. The Moss Dwarf is a race class. Uh, it's sort of a Moss Dwarf. It's sort of a, a fungal, um, bark-skinned creature with, uh, with uh, earthy flesh where plants can grow out of him. Fungi can grow out of him. Um, you get Nax and 
then you can pick different ones and you have different sort of abilities that come from those knacks. You have specialized armor that you wear as opposed to there. And here's an image of them. Really weird. I think this is some of the art in the new books is in this style. This is not my preference. I don't like this side of the art from the new books. I really do prefer the style from, um, well, we'll go into that more when I review those books, but there's a certain artist that does a lot of the main art, does all the covers and things, and I, I really love her work. I think it fits better with how I view this whole setting and tone. Um, and there's some great tables for random Moss Dwarf NPCs. Now there's a Fungi of Dolmen Wood, which I've used this table in a lot of other books. It's a D30 table, um, and there are some great, uh, some great random fungi in here. So you have, you can read straight across, uh, or you can of course roll randomly, um, I think six times, yeah. So uh, let's take Angel's Lament. Angel's Lament is the name. Its form is hollow chimneys. Its coloration is shining and golden. Its odor is of wet wool and its flavor is like wasabi with a sinus attack. And its effect is it's a moderate poison. It addles the mind. You lose D6 points of intelligence and charisma for 2D12 hours. A successful save reduces the loss by half. If any score goes below one, death results. But they're worth 30 gold pieces for obvious reasons. That's a, that's a potent poison. So, you know, or you can roll a bunch of times and combine your own cre uh, um, effects and, and forms and names and things like that. I've used this in a lot of my games. I'm using it in one of my West, my, my West Marches that I'm running right now. Um, there's a forest with a lot of fun, fungus in there, and, and the players have a kind of open bounty on different kinds of things. And I've used this table to develop those. So they can go harvest mushrooms if they want. Uh, really cool. And there's the Grimalkin, which is sort of like a Cheshire cat or Puss in Boots sort of, uh, you know, racist class from old school games. Um, great, great creature. I think that piece of art is actually from, um, yeah, I think it's actually from Alice in Wonderland, a version of Alice in Wonderland, like in the public domain. Uh, there's special spells for for uh, <laughs> for the Grimalkin, including things like Furball, Mouse Hex, Musk of the Most Ancient. Great. Um, and then there's one monster presented in this book, which is the Root Thing. And this is great because it has a set of encounters that you can have with the creature, as well as the special abilities, brief description of it, and its base stats. Uh, and then some traits for the Root Type, and then more generally. Great little creature that you have there. And then here is uh, more information for Dolmenwood in the back, which is, this is the sort of art that I'm talking about. I love that style. It reminds me of Secret of Kells or Wolf Walkers or something like that. Um, and a lot of the art from the new books is done in that style, as opposed to the creature that I showed you earlier. I think this is my preference. I really like that vibe. It reminds me of like the Sword in the Stone <laughs> from back in the day, like the old hand illustrated Disney cartoons. And then again, those, those, those like uh, more recent um, cartoons in that art style. I love it. So that's issue one. It's very short. Uh, it just has a few things, but it gives you a sense of kind of what the vibe of this setting is. Uh, it's an old school fairy tale forest where you have, um, uh, you know, moss dwarves and grimalkin. <laughs> uh, here is worm skin number two. This came out in spring of 2016. And in this issue, we have tavern fair generators, psychedelic compounds, and Langshorn, which is one of the villages in uh, Dolmenwood. And now Langshorn has been previewed elsewhere. You can you can read about it in the other books, um, and in the in the new books that are coming out. And I think it's pretty different from how it's presented here, Langshorn or Langshorn. I think it's Langshorn though. Um, common tavern fare, great D30 table for what you find in that tavern. So if you need a quick, I mean, there's lots of tables like this these days, but I think it's a great little thing to have. Um, you just print it out, put it on your screen. If you have players that go to taverns a lot, or if you're going to be doing a, a hex, a tavern crawl, a pub crawl, <laughs> or even if it's just, you know, you want a quick inspiration, you have a table like this. You get it out. What is my tavern selling or serving? Psychedelic compounds, which are kind of interesting, how to buy them, <laughs> consuming them, identifying them, and then what they do. You have uh, 30 entries here. And then, uh, again, you can roll your own. So you can just read straight across or you can roll. So here's Drake. Number nine is Drake, fermented root mash. It's smoked in a pipe. Its primary effect is violent psychosis. The more depraved, the better. And its side effect is it wrecks the adrenal system. Save versus poison, it was one point of con. can be recovered at a rate of one point per month of abstinence. 
or you can roll randomly across and do a bunch of them. So there's again 30 of these, which is really, really uh, cool. A very strange piece of art there for the uh, psychedelic Voyager Rigsby O'Callaghan. There's the High Wold, which is one of the reasons, uh, south of Lake Longmere. Um, and it's the corner of Dolmen with the High Wold, with High Hankel, uh, Langshorn, with the Goatmen aristocracy. And so you have some of the details of some of these hexes around this particular area. The Troth Stone and the Owl Cave, Langston Pool, the road to Link Long with the Swart Gibbet, the Mance of Lord Malbleet. Now, Lord Malbleet is still in it. Uh, I'm not sure he's quite the same as he is in here, but he's pretty similar. There's a great piece of art there. And the village of Lankshorn. Uh, there's the Lankshorn look because, of course, there are humans and goatmen who kind of uh, live together, and so there are humans that look slightly, slightly goaty. Um, you have old King Puskin's Road, the cats. Um, you don't want to uh, leave a fitting tribute or else, or you don't want to leave without leaving a fitting tribute or else you'll be attacked by dogs and shredded by, by cats while you sleep. The Ditchway, the King's Mounds, Barrow Bogies are out here. Uh, Barrow Bogies a great creature. Throttle Wit is the chief bogey. He wears a curious large brass basin on his shoulders. Um, places and pe people and places of Langshore and the Horn Stoats Rest in. That's an old piece of art, I think. With D6 rumors for the tavern. Or D16 tables. Yeah, D16 tables. Kind of odd table to have. <laughs> but you have it there. Uh, Jory the Bla Bladesmith, the Man of Gold Apothecary. Standing Stones, the Lord's Manor, the Church of St. Pastory, the Vicarage and the Graveyard, and the Church of the One True God, with a little uh, detail there about what that is um, and how that works in this particular setting. Father Egwin Doby. Um, uh, and then there's the Barrow Bogey, which is a Plague Fairy or a Pothead. <laughs> as it's often called. Um, again, this is the art style I'm not a big fan of. I like the uh, the other side of style. And I think the new book is, again, leaning more into that, leaning away from this. Although some of this style of art is present in the new book. Um, the bog zombie, which is one of the creatures here. And then a wolvish goat man and a short horn. Goat man thrall and the night, a night worm or night worms. Gross creepy creatures. Witch owls, which are really cool. Tall, milky white owls with violet eyes and uncannily rotating heads. And again, I like it. There's tr particular traits for this one. There's encounters for them and then layers for them. And once again, uh, that sort of thing at the end. So, Wormskin number two for 2016. You can tell, like, there's certainly putting together a vibe. And if you know what Dolman Wood's like now, it's actually developed quite a lot from this. This is not really how it feels, at least to me, anymore. I mean, by the end of these, if you take all of these issues together, I think you have a, a much more uh, tonal fit to what it's like now. But even so, I think it's changed a lot since the last of these, uh, of these zines came out. Uh, so this is Wormskin uh, number three, which is the Ruined Abbey of St. Clude. I think it's just Old English, they always pronounce it as the, actually, the white E is the. The Ruined Abbey of St. Clude. Um, and this is part one. And it also has Summer Stones and the Witching Rings languages, history, lore, monsters, and more. This is a much uh, more substantial one in terms of getting the setting down. Now, the Ruined Abbey of St. Clude is actually one of the adventures that's going to be written for this new setting. It's part of the, uh, part of the Kickstarter. Um, that's a goblet by Arthur Rackham. It's a great goblet. Uh, I love a little goblin built into it. Um, so the, uh, the Ruined Abbey of St. Clude is going to be included in the new set. But I don't know, because as you'll see, it's really weird here. Really weird. And they might keep it that weird in the new adventure, but I don't know. We'll see. There have been a few changes already to the tone a bit um, of the books that they have released initially and then how they re-released them. So, for example, um, in Winter's Daughter, there was a tonal shift. There was sort of a human sacrifice happening outside of the Dolmen, outside of the uh, Barrow of Sir Chide in the old edition, and then that's replaced with sort of a more creepy encounter, but it's less 
Um, I don't know, it's less gruesome, less grotesque. It doesn't really fit the tone of a fairy tale romance. We'd have a human sacrifice suddenly outside. So they changed it to make it more tonally consistent. And I wonder if they're going to do stuff like that with the rest of these books. Um, so if men, goats, and fairies in Dolmen Wood, this is where you first get, actually, issue three is where you first get a description of the history and of the different relations between these three major groups, humans, goats, and fairies, um, with the different relationships and the time, and, and the reference to the factions involved here, the Jeroen being one of the most important. Um, really, really cool. The languages of Dolmenwood, you have the Immortal Tongue of Fairy, High Elfish, Sylvan, Caprice, High Caprice, Ancient Drunic, Drunic, Liturgic, Old Woldish, and Woldish. Uh, languages are one of those things that I think a lot of people forget to do. Um, make languages for your setting. It really helps to draw it in, and, and, and if you insist on those languages and you don't just hand wave them and you let certain characters speak certain languages and give them opportunities to use those it makes the setting really come alive in a special way that and, and currency i think if you make those two things particular players will pick up on it very quickly at least m most of my players do and have the summer stones and the witching ring you get these standing stones throughout dolmen wood it's called dolmen wood right so you have dolmens that stand throughout the entirety of the wood in various places they stand on ley lines and block things and connect things and they you know stop fairies from passing through certain things it's great um sort of meta hex crawling encounters to run into things that are I don't say I don't mean meta in like game sense but like you know above and beyond each individual hex there's a connection between large portions of the forest through these rings and, and ley lines and things and the stones are really cool um, you get a description of what they're like and what's happening on them called the summer stones um, regardless of the time of year it's always warm and balmy within the stones. The glades are never touched by frost or snow, even in the deepest of winters. And that relates to some of the background, where the Lord of Winter, one of the f uh, very powerful Fey Lords, once ruled here, and he was driven out by this alliance, and now they put up these summer stones to keep him out. The gates of Phrygia be shut. Great ideas. Great ideas. Uh, how to break the ward, if you want to do so. That's one of the things that certain people obviously would want to. And the armies of the Cold Prince, if you break three stones, are unleashed into Dolmenwood. And if you do all four, that's a Fey winter into Dolmenwood for all eternity. Interesting piece of art there. The woods east of Lake Longmere. So now you have a bit more of an expansion of the of the places here. There's the Scrabby who forgot his name. The Phantom Isle, the great piece of art there. A black elk goddess named Yenda haunts the island. The Spire and the Summer Stone. This is the sage, sage Stone. All who enter the Glade must say versus spells or be overcome. Hoagland's Spire. With three Badger Magi. They are bespectacled, bespectacled and wear adorable sweaters. They are concerned about the growing influence of the Sorceress Egrain. Great. Great little connections to different uh, places here. Um, Prigmarin Hill. Uh, there's a godlet here, Ambul. The Bastille Barrier, the Hermitage, and the Mouse Shrine. There's a Mogglewomp living there. Really terrifying. And again, that piece of art, not my favorite style, and it has been shifted over, as I keep saying. I think it's because I find this particular style of art not just not my favorite, but it's actually kind of distasteful to me. I don't enjoy it. So that's one of the downsides, I think, of these zines, is that there's a lot of that style of art throughout, and I really do prefer the new stuff, the, the newer look. Here's the Ruined Abbey itself, which is really dark in a lot of ways, uh, what's going on here, what happened to it, and, and how the people there are still kind of surviving. You can kind of turn your head a little bit and see the grounds of the Ruined Abbey. The Ruined Well, the Graveyard, the Bell Tower, and the Chapel. Um, the Ground Floor, the First Floor, and the Second Floor, Third Floor. There's the Mother Locket, a magic item here. Mr. Rag in Bones, a Rag and Bone. A Ruined Chapel with some mosaics uh, and descriptions of what those uh, mosaics are. Uh, obviously relating to the Saint Clude himself. Um, 
mausoleum of our command right Hecadeticon. Hecadeticon. A great name. Our command right Hecadeticon. <laughs> That's funny. Surface random encounters. And then ghostly monks, because this is a haunted abbey. And so there are ghostly monks here. Some creepy art there. What their attacks form if you fight them. And what they wish uh, before they before they go away forever. The secret. And then Monsters of the Woods. This one has a lot more monsters. There's a gloam, which is our undead entities formed of the corpses of a multitude of crows, ravens, or magpies. That's a really cool idea. They charm children in particular. But sometimes adults of pure morals who do not perceive the sinister atmosphere which surrounds the monster and are thus vulnerable to his charm-like ability. Where they might lair, how you might encounter them, and what they might look like. So I used this in one of my games at Gloam, and it was really ridiculous. My players, one of my players has said to me, I did not know I wanted, uh, I did not know I wanted you to roleplay a bunch of ravens all at once until now. <laughs> I didn't know I needed that because <laughs> it was really funny. Um, there's a Moggle Womp, greatly feared demi fey species. They parasitic upon mortals. There's wandering Moggle Womps and domestic Moggle Womps. Now, obviously, you can tell this is a very particular, very particular style of game. It's a very particular world. And whenever anything is very particular, there are going to be people who love it and going to be people who hate it. And I know that there are some people who look at Dolmenwood and are like, that's not my thing. It's not my interest in at all. But I find it to be absolutely delightful. It's right up my alley. Um, here's the Ruined Abbey of St. Clude, part two. That was uh, the end of Wormskin, obviously. Uh, three. All right, so the next of these is Wormskin issue four, which is the Ruined Abbey of St. Clude, part two. This is from autumn 2016. It's so fall 2016. Oh, gosh, seven years ago. <laughs> That's crazy. Uh, in this issue, we have the Atticorns Retreat as well, the Crypts of St. Clude, the Lesser Stones, and the Fickleness of Fairy Magic. Now, those last two in particular I love. The Atticorns Retreat and the Crypts of St. Clude's, I honestly have to say this is probably my least favorite part of all of these, even though it's one of the big central things here. It's just, again, the way it's presented and the art and stuff, I just am not a big fan of it. But the rest of it around it is really cool. Um, so we have... Um, this one's a, a, a pretty big, uh, pretty big uh, zine. This is in 70 pages, um, and that's all that we get on the first few: is the Atticorns Retreat, the Fickleness of Fairy Magic, Lesser Stones of Dolmenwood, and then most of this zine is the Ruined Abbey, Level Two, and and the end. Um, so the Atticorns Retreat is this really terrifying um, creature, Farthigny, the Fiddler in the Dark. He is the offspring of the Nag Lord, which is one of the really terrifying fey creatures here. This is his uh, his uh, form. And he has a cottage with torture rooms and experiment rooms. and It's pretty, pretty awful. And the songs that he sings. Um, and the items of interest in his... Uh, in his uh, den, in his house... Um, so, yeah, pretty gruesome, pretty grotesque. I'm probably gonna have something. They're probably gonna have something like that. I'm imagining in the actual setting. Um, but it's pretty creepy as presented here. The fickleness of fairy magic. I love this. Um, it's a D12 to see how does this magic item fickle? How does it uh, lose its power? The item continues to operate until what? And there's just 12 uh, different entries, right? Because fairy magic doesn't work the same way for us mortals as it would for them. So we call them magical, but they don't have that same sort of, it's not the same kind of magic that, that we mean when we, when we have a, a magic item created by a wizard or something like that. Um, it has separate rules. And I like that about the fairy, the fey world, which has its own set of rules, that they sound arbitrary. They sound... Um, very strange. They often are, but to the Fae, they're completely natural the same way. They're as natural as the fact that when you drop something, it falls. It feels the same way to them. 
Then there's the lesser stones of Dolmen because you have various other uh, Dolmens you can find throughout the wood. And again, you have a D30 table here, which you can mix and match or read straight across. And I really like that. I've used this in other games when I'm developing sorts of, you know, standing stones and things like that. So you have a material, it's, you know, it's a, a chalk stone, a column. It's been carefully cleaned by whom? And it's slid into a ditch. Um, it's unusual property. Let's see, what was that? It's, it's that semi-ethereal. And it's feature of note is that it has geometric features, uh, symbols featuring recognizable landmarks in the wood. If studied, the marker must be the location of a treasure hoard. That's really cool. You get a whole bunch of different materials and forms, surfaces, settings, a D30 table for all of that. Then you get the Ruined Abbey Part 2, which is the crypts below. What happened to St. Clude? And it's not good. It's not good here. He is fighting a black unicorn, and they were molded together. Um, and it's unpleasant. And the monks who have uh, been here since then try to bring him back. And in so doing, they have done something... Uh, and it's pretty gross. Brought both the creature he was fighting and him back, their spirits, together and have molded them into one. And as a result, there's this chaos that's bursting through the entirety of the Abbey. And uh, everything is warping and changing. And pretty, uh, pretty awful. It's a pretty simple dungeon map. There's not a lot going on here. I mean, there is a lot going on here, I should say. But it is, uh, it is uh, pretty dark and uh, pretty sad. Um, there's not a lot of heroism here, and there's not a lot of hope here. Which, I, again, I'm just not a big fan of that particular vibe. Um, and, uh, and I think it's one way of going with this sort of weird... But I don't think it's the way that fairy tales tend to go. And I think that as a fairy tale would... I don't think the tone fits terribly well, which is why I wonder if they're going to change this or how they're going to change this for the, the new setting. They might not. It might just be pretty much as it is here, but I, I would be surprised if they left it entirely the same. D20 item table and the condition of that item. There are the Western crypts, uh, the Loyalists, the different fractures, the, so the factions within the Order as they have now kind of found themselves down here, the Abbot and the Sub Prior, um, how they survive. And these monks, as they die, because of the chaos, they're, they're being kind of brought back but it's not all good when they come back. In fact, most of them are not coming back very well. <laughs> not very good at all. Um, things are getting pretty bad down here. So I imagine most of this will be the same, but I wonder if there will be a way of fixing things written as written th that makes it a little bit less depressing or, uh, or uh, hopeless. Um, there's the tomb of St. Clude himself. Um... Yep, that's that. That's the creature. Very gross and grotesque. Um, and then as you go through, you can find out what's going on, basically, and then you have to try to find your way out, essentially. <laughs> Maybe try to deal with this horrible um, chaos thing. And how to... Uh, how to get out of the entirety of the place. Um, so it's a big, it's a big dungeon. More or less, more or less. Um, but um, it's the majority of this middle book. All right, so that is the Ruin Navy of Saint Clude, Part Two, which is fourth issue. Fifth issue is uh, from Winter 2017, and this is the uh, hex crawling in Dolmenwood and Hags Addle and more monsters of the wood, especially the Druin. This one's uh, 50 pages, so it's slightly smaller than the last one, um, and you have. But just rules for, for various things. The Watchers of the Wood with the Druun, which is one of the factions here. Their, their mantra is seek, know, and keep. So we'll see how that goes. Um, their lifestyle, their powers, their relationship with the other factions in the dungeon. Uh, I've used, so I basically took them and added them into one of my worlds. Although I made them a bit more ridiculous than they are here. Made them a bit more, they think, this, this is how they think they are, but they're actually a little bit absurd. In my world, I put them in there that way. Um, what their schemes and goals are, and rumors about them. And then hex crawling and rules for hex crawling. And I think these are definitely expanded in the new game. So there's a lot of procedures that have been uh, added in to the books 
when it comes the new books that are coming out when it comes to hex crawling and camping and things like that random events and encounters uh, weather and mishaps and all of that which is cool that the tables here are great if you want to have a, a bit more of a procedure for this whole process of hex crawling and camping uh, hags addle there is a hag out here who's really creepy uh, nearby is the Atticorns retreat from the last issue uh, she's pretty horrifying the uh, the hag um, the baffle stone the hag's lair the time hole the tower of frost um, lady frost dust shadow occupies the upper floor and I like that's one of the things I love about this is that elfish names are fairy names are really cool they're all like descriptive and they sound more like a a bad translation of something that sounds much more beautiful <laughs> in some other language and I love that um, the Hag of the Marsh is always different each time she appears. The great D12 table, of what she appears to be, her appearance, how it's modified clothing, attitude, speech, and what she's carrying. And then uh, her supernatural abilities, her character, and her hut, if you can happen to get into her hut. And her hut is one of the ways of getting into the realm of fairy. Haggling and entertainment of guests and adventure hooks that relate to her, rumors about the Hag and her magical items that she has, or can have. Some of these are really cool. I like the Willow Switch. I really like the Marsh Lantern. Really cool ideas. Great piece of, I think, Arthur Rackham art there. Yeah, that looks like Arthur Rackham. Monsters of the Wood. You have the Boggin, uh, the Brambling, the Droon themselves, the Flam Braggard, weird dudes, and sort of golem-like things. And then the back of the book has the hexes that are detailed here. So that's number five. A little bit shorter, but still quite interesting. All of these are very interesting. And then number six is from Spring 2017. Uh, this has Spiritus Beverages, the Fairy Lords, and the Worms, and the city of the town of Prigward, which is one of the places you can go to. Um, this is one of my favorite of the uh, books, of the zines. I love this one. This is volume six. It has the Fairy Lords, and I think they're really cool. The Blind King, the Cold Prince... Again, some of this more ridiculous art. Not a big fan of that. The uh, Duke My Fleur, the Dirk, Duke Who Cherishes Dreams, the Earl of Yellow, the Hag Queen, Thorn Rosie, Lady Belladonna, the Lady of Midnight, the Lady of Spring Unending, Lord Gladhand, Prince Mallowheart, also known as Prince Seven Past Noon, Princess Andromathea, Half Satyr, the Prince Who Is Seven, Queen Abyssinia, the King Queen King Hathor, and the Queen of Blackbirds. Very interesting. Hey, the Brackenwall calendar, and actually you can get a PDF, a free PDF on their website that has this entire calendar broken down for you. Really, really great document. Um, and you can uh, use it. If you're gonna run in Dolmenwood, you'd wanna use it for sure to keep track of things. It has the days of the week, the months of the year, and the unseasons. Really cool things that can happen between certain particular seasons. Uh, so for example, every three to five years, this is in a third one. One in four chance, the month of Igwild sees the blooming of particularly beautiful and fecund fungus. Fecund? Fecund? <laughs> uh, fungus throughout the forest. These blossoms last for the entire month and grow to fantastic proportions, dwarfing humans as they go about their way. Then upon the last eve of Igwild, the fungi dissolve into a rainbow-hued sludge which drains into the rivers and washes away. The season of the giant fungus is known as Colligwild. Colligwild. Really cool. Just doesn't happen every time. Every three to five years, there's a one in four chance of this happening. And these unseasons are really cool. There's the high feast days, the major feast days, um, astrology high days, and saints days. So I know that those will be um, obviously more detailed in the um, in the book itself. It says in future Dolmenwood scenes. I think they're just going to do it in or in Wormskin scenes. I think they're just going to do it in one of the in the book itself. Prigwort, which is one of the and the surrounding uh, hexes, the shrine in the cliffs, the witch glade. Harrowmore Keep and the Groaning Lock. Great piece of art there. The town of Prigwort itself, the Worm Cave. All the, the, the hoard of this worm, which is massive. Tons and tons and tons of treasure in there. Uh, the Gorth Stone. The Phantom of the Pool. The Bakery, Highway Women. 3D4 Young Women. Uh, give us all your baked goods. That's what they cry. They can indeed be pacified by relinquishing of high-quality pastry products, which is amazing. They are the daughters of the baker. Um, and the baker's dozen. This is one of the locations here. 
Uh, it's a mother and her 12 daughters. Um, one who inquires into the origin of the daughters too deep will come upon a mystery upon which none of the inhabitants of the house will elaborate. The baker is unmarried and the daughters never speak of their father or fathers. Guests. Here's mother. Um, a ring of vanishing, a wand of condiments, uh, and uh, giant gingerbread men who are wandering around. Tarts of infatuation, healing cookies, <laughs> the dough pool, a raging yeast demon, and adventure hooks that lead you to this particular, uh, perhaps cursed bakery. The Gingerbread Grimoire, which is a book you can get there, which has some spells that relate to cooking, in particular cook baking. The people and places of Prigwort, the Elevated Council of Brewmasters, the Consulting Wizard, Brandy Biles, Dashing Garments lists, type, and item, uh, type of item and its cost, which is great, how much it costs there, material and the type of coin that you need to use to buy it, embellishment and additional costs, so you can make your clothing really, really ridiculous and awesome and expensive. Uh, wayside lodgings, the different rooms and what they cost there. Uh, Oaf in the Oast, pub and baths, uh, proprietors of it, the clashed antlers, the wrink wrinkled meddler, because of course this is a town that's all about beer and brewing, and so there's lots of taverns and inns here. The Church of St. Wayline, rumors here. Uh, a good number of them, 18 of them. Elevated Brewmaster Smide and Wilfrey, adjusting the spicing of a vat of Buckland Fizz. Spiritist beverages, because of course, you gotta have drinks. So there's a d20 table for your own drinks, and you can read straight across, or roll randomly. Great little things. The Kelpie, and then Monsters of the Wood. The Kelpie, um, and the Worms, which are awesome. There's the Black Bile Worm, the Phlegm Worm, the blood worm and the yellow bile worm, which are, of course, the four traditional humors, which fits perfectly with the setting and tone of this game. And again, the areas, the map of the area around Prigwort. So that's number six. We've got two more. Two more. Number seven is from the summer of 2017. This is Hex Mania. This is a bunch of hexes. This is a large one, 70 pages, and this is just a whole bunch of hexes around the place. Uh, you have common names uh, in Dolmenwood. Male, female, surnames for humans, for elves, male and female, great, prick of the nail, porcelain begets only dreams, gleanings from lost days, supper before noon, fantastic names for elves. Moss dwarves and wood grooves, which is, wood grooves are another kind of uh, kindred you can play, kind of like bat folk. Uh, Grimalkin and then clerics, fighters, thieves, and magic users, and of course magic users get honorifics, which is perfect because you're a sorcerer, you're going to have some cool title. Henchmen of Dolmenwood and how to get them. Um, it's an interesting piece of art because it's very different, it seems to me, than the other art that's come before in its tone. Rolling up of henchmen and rates of pay. Basic details for the henchmen and what they're carrying. Uh, and personalities for them. Great, which is a D30 personality and motivation, a D30 ambition as well. So you can make each henchman interesting and unique if you wanted. Great for level zero characters, too. Uh, Drig Bolton and the Surrounds, the Hall of the Fomorian, which is a really interesting creature. The Ruined Cottage, the Hamlet of Drig Bolton, which relates to a particular adventure, the weird that befell Drig Bolton, which I think is getting redone. It's really bizarre. It's really weird. <laughs> um, I have it. I'm not sure I would ever run it, because it's very strange. It's cool, but I don't know if it fits the vibe of most games that I like to play. Uh, the Ruins of Midge Warrow, The Witch Hereth, uh, Avernal Lake in the Dock, The Troll Bridge in the Camp of Captain Snarkscorn, Toll Bridge. There's a lot of hexes detailed here. The Stag Lord himself, The Refuge of St. Key, the Chapel, The Village of Orb Swallow, what's going on there, Rumors and the Somber Lamb, The Golden Wood, The Wench Gate, The Grey Vorpal Monolith. North Stone and the Parallel Glade, that's really cool. And then you've got uh, Galux Stone, the House of Aethagrim. Again, very strange creatures with very interesting art. Shubs and Nana. Interesting hex here. A Buried Titanic Skull. The Bridging Ring. Cool, a manor built on the very edge of this cliff. Shantywood Isle and the River Hamath, as seen from Drake. 
Tea Tent and the Dreaming Snail. <laughs> and then Monsters of the Wood. Um, there's an Antler Wraith, an Andrew, a Crook Horn, Goatman, Droon Wife, Kilnling, Giant Sail, Snail, Psionic, and Rapacious, a Moss Dwarf, a Witch, and a bunch of particular uh, witches and patrons. Wood Grooves, and then that's it for this one. So a bunch of hexes. Drake Bolton and the area around it, east of Prigward around it, and from Linkshorn down to Drake. Now last but not least, we have issue 8, which is the final one ever released in winter 2018. So this is five years old now. And this one features witches, fungal monsters, and camping rules. This one's 45 pages, so it's one of the shorter issues. Um... So as you can see, that this is just pretty much Gavin Norman himself. And I think you can tell that the tone is different. The tone is different. Um, so we have Gavin Norman, the sisters of the Chalice and the Moon. Uh, the, the hags here, the women witches of the city. Or I should say they're hags, they're witches. Uh, but they serve a bunch of extra um, planar powers and patrons. Um, they're not really necessarily allied with the Fae. They're not really necessarily allied with the turn. In fact, they're kind of at odds. Um, and then there's their powers and what they do. Their relationship with other factions. Um, they do their own thing. Uh, let's see. Rumors that relate to them. And then rules for camping, once again. Setting camp, in particular... Firewood, fetching water, fire buildings, <laughs> uh, fire building and all that, sorry, fire buildings, fire building. Uh, forging, hunting and fishing, resting, evening activities and camaraderie and what you might be able to do there and how that might help. Um, now, again, these rules are going to be more fleshed out, I think, in the book itself, but it's a nice kind of subsystem to have if you want to make a, a more, you know, again, mechanical built up system. For, for all of these things. Uh, different forest campsites you can run into. The site and the features of that site. Uh, strange waters and what this what this water might do. <laughs> its form, at the appearance of the water, its taste and the effect if consumed. Monsters of the wood, the brain conch. Great piece of art there. Awesome, I love that. The pook moral, wrong uncles. And then that book itself with uh, a few extra ads at the back for the Midderlands and then Dolmenwood itself. So I think you can tell that last issue is very different in its tone and just in the art chosen than in the previous ones. And so I think um, by, the, by this point, by Wormskin issue eight, which is the very last one, um, things were slightly going in a different direction in terms of the, the art style and the design. And I wonder now, going back, um, it'll be interesting to see looking at the PDFs of this book as it comes out, how much of the old stuff was kept and how much of it was redone and revised and changed direction. So anyway, I hope this has been interesting. I know that, again, you can't necessarily get these books, so it's not like I go out and buy them. You can get some of them, I think, in print. I don't know where you can get them in PDF. I'll link it below to where you can go to the Dolmenwood stuff where you can get the free PDFs uh, of the Dolmenwood setting preview and the calendar and the welcome to the setting and also um, where you can... Uh, pre-order the new set but if you can get a hold of these you know uh, in pdf or in physical copy i'd recommend it if it's not too egregiously expensive because they're great to have um you know just as again kind of a a, a quick reference or a, a piece of uh, history in a way because you know you can't really get these anymore and it's going to be a very different form i think when they actually come out all right, well, I hope, again, this has been interesting, and I will see you guys in another video.